Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth from Gibson's Bookstore, the events coordinator, and I am joined by two wonderful authors this evening. We are here to celebrate Erin Bowman on the release day of her newest book, Dustborn. It is her release day and we are very excited to have this book in discussion with Susan Dennard, who is Aaron's friend. We are so thrilled to have these two here tonight. If you are in our audience, we do have a chat sidebar going. Um, please make sure that your settings are all set to all panelists and attendees so you can have a great conversation going with your fellow audience members. Signed copies of Aaron's books are available from Gibson's Bookstore. And please, uh, if we will be answering audience questions later in the event, so please do put them in to the chat sidebar or the Q&A function. Ladies, thank you for joining me this evening. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you so much. Let's get going. Uh, please, over to you. Um, I think I'm going to start by just sort of explaining my book really quickly. Um, and then Susan and I are just going to have a really informal chit chat about world building. And then I'm sure we'll get off topic and we'll answer questions and it's going to be great. Um, but for those of you who you probably know what it's about since you're here at this event. But if you don't know, Dustborn is about a girl named Delta who grows up in this very desolate wastelands um, and where water is very scarce and there's solar storms and dust storms and horrible weather. And essentially she ends up sort of setting out on this adventure after her pack, her family gets taken captive to rescue them and uh, discovers that there's a lot more to her world than she realizes. She also has what is believed to be a map to this mythical place called the Verdant branded on her back. Um, the only trouble is no one knows how to read this map. So um, that location she knows is gonna be a big bargaining chip and potentially getting her family back once she confronts um, the people who took her, which is basically this man known as the general. Um, and she wants to kind of figure out how to read the map so she can potentially bargain and deal that knowledge back to him in exchange for her family's freedom. So that's like the quick pitch as if you were here right when this started, you heard Sue say like there is so much that happens in this book and there really is because I intended it to be more than one book, but sometimes publishing doesn't let us do exactly what we want. <laughs> so it, it got restructured into a standalone and even still there's stuff that I had planned that is not in this book because I couldn't fit it all, but I did my best <laughs> and it's very oh, fast we both we both just had to condense multiple books that's into true one. yeah so that's that's, that's true I, I shouldn't say it's funny it was hard guys hard. we had to work really hard <laughs> it is super hard and one of them are it's both frustrating and validating like the biggest complaint i don't read a ton of reviews but i'm bad i always peek at the beginning because i just want to know how my book is being received and then after i get a general feeling i like back away and don't look at reviews anymore because they don't really help me. Reviews are for other readers. But I always peek and I've seen over and over the biggest complaint is this should have been more than one book, which is like validating, but also I'm like, ah, but hey, it it happens. We don't always have full control over all of the things that we wish we did, but you know. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, I have some questions, but first I want to say because somebody was saying how all of your graphics have been so good for this book. And I'm assuming you made them all. I did. I did. Okay. Thank you. So if anyone here doesn't know, my background is in design. That's what I did professionally before I got into writing. So I was a web designer and graphic designer. So I tend to just whip up most of my own stuff and then I share them over with my publisher and they will sometimes, you know, post and signal boost as well. Um, but thank you. They all look great. That's a good job, Erin. <laughs> they do. They look really good. And you do have like, it's the most gorgeous cover I've ever seen. It, I thought nothing can be Vengeance Road and then Dustborn came along. I think it's the the team at HMH, I will say, because Vengeance Road, my Westerns, Vengeance Road and Retribution Rails are HMH books as well. Um, and they just know, my editor has like a vision of what the aesthetic should be. Um, she and I usually have a shared Pinterest board. I don't know if I've ever told you do this Sue? have I told you this we like make a Pinterest board of things that feel like the book elements we like styles we like and then she reaches out to artists and both with both of these books my westerns and this one she like found the perfect artist and luckily they were free to do the project so I've been really really 
really lucky and grateful because they are beautiful covers. Beautiful. All right. So I have some questions for you about since this, the theme of this workshop is world building and I'm still reading. So nothing will be spoilery because I still don't know the big reveals. Um, although I like, there is so much that happens in this book, you guys, I can't believe I'm only halfway. Cause I'm like, how many <laughs> events and twists and turns have we now reached? I mean, it's impressive. It's impressive that she has squeezed so much into this story. It shows an efficiency of prose, which I personally greatly value in writing. I am not someone who likes long writing, not to shade on that at all. It's just not something I tend to gravitate toward, but this, this book does not have that. It is very spare in a good way. Um, so my first question for you is, is this based on our world? Is it our world in the future or is it like an alternate world? Is that spoilery? Is the answer I to that- You can't answer it without spoiling things. I mean, my it's assumption okay. is yes, but I'm, is there a specific place in this world where it's happening? It, so I purposely, that your, your question does get answered later in the book. So I don't want to answer it directly, but I will say it is structured to feel extremely familiar. And then when you, when you get your answer that either confirms or denies that, <laughs> it will, all, I think, all kind of click and make sense. But while I built it, I was definitely thinking of locations in our world, whether that answers or doesn't answer the question. Um, specifically, like, I don't know if you've reached it yet. Have they reached like Powder Town and gone past like the geysers and hot springs and everything? Yes. yes. Yeah. I so like got to Powder Town. <laughs> so like the Southwest and Yellowstone, um, those areas of the U.S. very much inspired the world building for this. Whether or not that's where you actually are, I'm going to <laughs> hold back. But um Sort of a side tangent on this though, this book, the biggest inspiration for it was that I wanted to write another Western, which, you know, I did in Vengeance Road and Retribution Rails, but I did not want to be constrained by our history, our That's timeline. Question. Oh, did you, question. sorry, do you want to ask? Go, go right ahead, now? go, go. Um, but I, I loved playing in that sandbox, like that landscape and setting and um, the ruggedness of it, the technology of that time. Like I loved all of those things while writing my Westerns. And I just wanted to be able to make my own rules and make my own layout and maps and places. So that's sort of where Dustborn came from was I set out with the world first, which is why this is an interesting topic. And I had to find the story later. And I've never actually written a book like that yet. All of my other books that I've written have come from like um, a what if scenario first or a character comes to me first. And this one was, I was building the world and I had to find the story. Um, but it was really fun to be able to write what felt like another Western again, but blend in other, other genres and like not be like, ooh, was there water in this location in 1887? I don't know, let me go find a historical atlas or, oh, how did they get these resources then? I don't know, let me go down a research wormhole. Um, I mean, you still had to do research, but it yeah, didn't have to different. be historically accurate. <laughs> That's, that was kind of one of my question then was like, was it easier because you didn't have to actually do that sort of intensive historical research? I think in some ways, which is probably, you'd probably agree, Suze, it doesn't matter what you write. <laughs> Every book is challenging in its own way. Um, and half the time I, I like set out, I'm like, oh, I'm going to write a simple book this time. And then it's never simple, um, unfortunately. But from a research perspective, yes, this was significantly easier because of my Westerns, I did like months of research for each book before I started even drafting them. Whereas yeah. these, I sort of built the world and I did all my brainstorming, but I was able to sort of jump in with my rough outline and write. And then if I was like, ooh, how would this work? I need to research a little. I could like, you know, just hop on Google and look something up. It wasn't as intense as, I mean, you've written historical fiction, you, you know. <laughs> Right? Would you say it was easier to write your historical fictions or your fantasy worlds? You're right. I mean, it's not necessarily easier. It always too depends on the complexity and of the story. Like you had the structural challenge of combining multiple things into one. Um, I and I always say I'll never write historical again, but I know I know me one day I probably will. You can't make those promises. No, I know. I, that's like when I finished the westerns, I was like, I'm never writing westerns again. I'm writing a sci-fi horror, and I wrote Contagion because I just I get bored of what I'm doing and I jump to something else. But I have a sweet spot for historical too. It's really 
there's a lot of research that has to happen up front, but I also think there's something reassuring about knowing that the answer exists if you just dig enough. If you're like, how would this work? Well, you can actually find the answer. Where sometimes if you're writing fantasy or sci-fi and you're building the world from the ground up on your own, you got to figure out how it works. You know, it's kind of on you, which is can be a blessing or a curse. I don't know if you agree with that. But. Yes, it can be a blessing and a curse. Yeah. I am like doing revisions for the luminaries right now, editorial revisions. And one of the questions is like, I'll just go ahead and tell you guys, like, how does money work here? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. This is not something I have thought of. I'll admit it. That that one, I just went right by. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting you mentioned that because I don't have money in Dustborn. Everything's based on trade, yeah. which even still I think is probably one of, I'm really pl- proud of the world building in this book, but if I'm being completely honest, it's one of the weaker elements, I think. But I also think in this world where resources are super scarce, um, it just makes sense that the, one of the most valuable items would be like, what do you have? I need yeah, water. You'll trade me water for this. Great. Let's make a deal. So everything's deal-based and trade-based. And sometimes the trade is even like a promise or your word, but that's because I got to that point while building the world. I'm like, well, how do people get things? How, how do they get the resources they need? Is there money? And I was like, no, I'm not going to do money. I'm going to have it all. Which makes sense though, right? Yeah. Money requires everyone to agree that money is valuable, right? Like if all of us decided dollar bills meant nothing, money would no longer function. And then you have such a loose society in your world. Yeah. Who would have even just come up with a uniform way of payment? So the barter thing totally works. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes me feel a little better. And it's true. And then someone has to make it too, right? Like someone has to be producing yeah. money and saying like, like creating this is money. thing. Yeah. yeah. So like in- Delta's world, like the things that are really valuable are water, obviously, or any sort of supplies, like the town she grew up in, um, harvests baking soda, essentially, and like that's very valuable. Um, uh, Black powder and like ammunition for weapons is super valuable, right? So like those are the currencies, basically, within the story. So that kind of segues into one of my questions. How did you decide what kind of tech they would have, like she could still use from the old world? versus what they don't have and what they've figured out on their own. Cause like there were certain things where I was like, oh, I don't think this is spoilery, but she figures out how to make water at one point. And I was like, oh, cool. How did they figure that out versus some of the other things that aren't there? Um, and also I was like, remember this Susan, in case you ever need water. <laughs> yeah, so the method of making water, which is not a big spoiler, um, it's not going to yield you a ton of water. It's called an inverted well and survivalists will do this or people like in the backwoods and they don't have water is essentially, should I get into this? This is going to get really fun guys. You essentially dig a hole. You end up urinating in said hole. And if you spread something over the top of the hole, like plastic, and then place a pebble, like a very light weight in the center of the plastic, your plastic's now going to be bowed or bowed. I don't know. Um, And as the heat of the sun in the day warms up your urine, it will evaporate and the condensation will gather on this plastic. And so then back in the hole on top of your urine, you have a cup that has nothing in it. And so the condensation will gather and drop down from that point into your cup. And then you have totally drinkable water. So Delta learns that trick from a trader in the book and she ends up using it later when she's in moments of need. Um, But it's, it's gonna be a minimal amount of water. It might be life saving, life saving in small instances, but you need more than just that. Um, but in terms of what was the question, how did I decide which tech? Yeah, like how did you kind of evaluate what survived from the past and what hasn't, what have they figured out on their own? Yeah. So, um, a lot of it came from the type of world I wanted to build. And I mentioned earlier, I wanted it to feel more like a Western than like a futuristic, um, sci-fi, even though there are sci-fi, like this book is a huge genre blended mashup. Um, but essentially like it often gets pitched as like Mad Max meets the hundred meets, meets like gunslinger girl and stuff like that. And I think that's accurate. But when I was writing it, I was like, I want to do Mad Max, like without gasoline and cars. Like I don't want tech that advanced. So a lot of it just came from the type of story I wanted to tell, which I don't know if that's a cop-out answer. Um, but, but from that place, then I was like, okay, what might have happened to have made certain things 
unusable. And so there are like rovers and vehicles, these aren't huge spoilers that that exist in this world and Delta comes across them, but they're like rusted out chassis. They're things that have fallen to the wayside and people have taken things like the wheels from them and applied them to carts and like vehicles that they can use with manpower and animal power, like mules pulling them, whereas they don't have gasoline or a mean to keep the rovers going. So I kind of just did that. I was like, how can I keep it really rustic? And then I guess this goes to one of the cardinal rules of world building is you establish your rules and then you stick to them. And as long as you do that, it ends up being believable. I think that's true with magic systems too. Um, as long as, would you agree, Suze, right? Like you just- Yeah, I, that's like the biggest pet peeve for me is when a writer either doesn't really establish any rules. So it's just sort of a free for all. And I can never figure out what the rules of this ma magic system or world are, or they break their own rules. Um, I, I really- I'm a stickler for like you make the rules and maybe you won't figure out the rules till you finish your first draft. You know, I often oh, don't, I don't necessarily set them up before I write. Um, I give myself the freedom to figure it out as I'm going, but then once I'm revising, I'm like, these are the rules we stick, we stick by them. And I might hate myself later in a series. <laughs> Why did I make that rule? But gosh, darn it. I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Well, that's a good point, right? With series, sometimes you I agree. I will often write something and I know what I think the rules are, but I feel like the first draft is often a discovery phase where you're telling yourself the story anyway. You might think you know what it is, but then you finish and you go, oh, okay, I'm going to change this. I'm going to revise that. And now I know what I'm trying to do. Um, but when you're writing a series, then you've locked in those rules in book one. And yes. sometimes you can talk yourself out of a few of them or tweak them with new reveals in the sequels, but your Witchland series is how many books long now? Like you've oh probably gosh. written yourself into some corners. Oh my gosh, I've written myself into so many corners and, or I've just been like, oh, I had a better idea, but I'm locked into this idea. Right. So yeah. here we go, make it cool. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, because I started working on that book eight years ago. So it's like, at this point, there's so much that's been set up and established. And also I just have become a better writer and I have a better brain. And better so there, are, there are ideas I'm locked into that I'm like, ah. Man. Well, and sometimes you just need more time too. Like, I feel like I often have epiphanies or aha moments when I have time away from a book. And sometimes publishing schedules don't allow you that, or you're stuck in a revision. You're like, well, I have to solve it now because this is due and I have a deadline. And then like, you know, with you, three or four years later on book number five, you go, oh, that's the solution I should have used. Absolutely. That has happened. <laughs> yes. But yeah, that's part of like the growing pains, I think for new authors, it's, is you, you realize like, oh, this book is published now. I am really locked in. And it's a real challenge if you're writing a series to maybe figure out where to go. Um, you do get better at it though. Not that it gets easier per se, but you just get better at like, okay, these are the circumstances under which I now must create quickly. So here we go. Here we go. <laughs> um, all right, I have another question for you. Yeah. Uh, and that is just a general question that I found really interesting is there's a part in the book where you talk about the different gods. So I was just wondering how you came up with them. Was there anything inspiring? Why the, those gods? Yeah, I'm trying to think of how I can talk about this in a non-spoilery way also. Um, the, I mean, a big part of it was you look to at um, history in this world, even in our world, when people going way back, if they didn't understand something, something it was like, oh, well, the gods do it. This is the God of the sun or this God controls the weather. Um, and Delta's world is so, 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 um, it's just really harsh and they have very little control and they're really at the mercy of the storms that this world um, sends at them, which can be extremely unpredictable. Uh, sometimes they have these solar flares or these auroras on the horizon and they know like a giant solar flare is going to come and a big storm is going to come. So they have a little bit of um, preparation that they can do, but really the gods for them, and they look to the gods as we are being punished. They think that they have mis- they haven't put the right trust in their gods. They haven't served their gods properly and their the gods have abandoned them. That's how, that's what you learn at the start of the novel. I guess I should go back there is that everyone feels that if they are um, 
good to the earth if they have trust in the gods the gods will reappear and the green that once existed on this planet will return um and so a big reason that the gods are in the sky and they they are basically praying to different stars in the sky that they think are the gods um is because they think they're up there they abandoned us they left and if we do what we need to do they will come back if we are faithful and just have blind faith they will return to us um so i guess a big part of it came down from to me thinking about what when we have no power, it's really nice to believe that the answer is that someone's going to come save me <laughs> or that there's a reason that this is happening. Um, so that sort of uh, went into how I developed them. Was your question based on their like their names and how I developed what God was in charge of what kind no, of? No, I this... was just curious if there was anything in particular, like you answered my question. Okay, I kind of rambled on that one. That inspired it, like like I have like a whole, and I can't say anything with the Witchlands. It's super spoilery where I came, how my God system works. <laughs> now I've probably just given something away too, by admitting that, gosh, ye. but <laughs> I, I'm wondering, yeah, just from like a, as a creative author, world building point of view, sort of what your starting point was and that you just answered it. So. Okay. Cool. Good. Thank you. It's so tricky because so much of this, and it's not because you haven't finished it yet, Sue's like, even if you finished it, you would be having the same thing. It's just tricky for me to talk about some of the world building in this book because there are like a sequence of huge reveals that Susan is not at yet. And if anyone here is cur currently reading, they all come like at the very end of the second act, beginning of the third. Um, and a lot of world building things click into place there, but I can't really talk about them with you without spoiling <laughs> We need like a recap, like a part two of this in like a month or something. There you we go, know. for people who've read the book. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Well, is there anything else that you have on the top of your head to talk about in terms of world building that you wanted to share or impart? I want, I mean, I know what I would say for this world building, but I'm curious what you would say as well. So I'm going to throw a question your way and we can both answer them. Um, world building is such a big undertaking, right? And it's something I think a lot of people are always like, give me like, how do I world build? Give me like the quick, dirty, like, what do I need to do to world build? Um, which is like kind of a loaded question. Cause I feel like it's a very <laughs> big undertaking, but if you had to say, like, if you had to pick like the foundations of world building, what would you say? Like, where do you start, I guess? What for you is your like, or does it depend on your book? Definitely depends on the book. Yeah, absolutely. But but in that regard, I would say the foundation of world building is like, what are you hoping to achieve with this book? Um, there's like, like the witch lands versus even the luminaries, which I'm working on now. I would say, you know, the witch lands in scope and size is so much bigger, both as a series and as a literal physical space. And the luminaries is all concentrated in one town. So I'm able, mm -hmm. so even though there's this whole society behind it that I have fleshed out, a lot of that doesn't ever have to be on the page, which is also the same is true, the same is true with the witch lands. Not everything needs to be on the page at all. But I also include a lot more because I want to give that feeling of this is a big world and there's so much that you're never even going to get to see. I like what you say because one of my biggest things if someone was to ask me would be to like over plan like over plan but it doesn't mean it needs to go on the page but I think the more you know about your world like half of world building is you figuring it out yourself and then figuring out which of those details actually need to be on the page. Um, exactly. And I guess this isn't necessarily like a foundation of world building, um, like a pillar of it or whatever, but I find it, and I know you do too, I find it immensely helpful to draw maps, sketches, and like maps can be, when we read a fantasy book or a sci-fi book or whatever, sometimes you open it and there's like the map of the world, right? And you see all the places, like sketch those maps, but also sketch like scenes. Like I know you do this too, Susan, I do it as well. Like, because otherwise, especially whenever I have like a, like a fleeing or a fight scene, like through a city or a, a con, like a very congested area, I cannot keep things straight. If I don't sketch out the roads and draw the arrows, they're going to go this way. They're going to, and I know you do this too. I've seen pictures of it. Um, but it's, it's so immensely helpful. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a literally a map of your choreography. I'm actually have my newsletter on Friday. I'm talk about that exactly. Yeah. And I share a picture of one I, I used in the luminaries. Cause yes, I mean, it's so helpful to have a map 
both on a macro scale for your big world building, but just when you get down to the nitty gritty scenes, especially heavily choreographed scenes like chase scenes, for example, it's just a lot easier if you know where they're going before you dive in. Yeah, I feel like it's, I don't know if every reader can tell if the author mapped it out or not. I feel like I've definitely read some books where I'm like, I can't picture this. So I feel like the author doesn't have it pictured. Um, but even that aside, like not even with that in mind, it will just make your life easier as a writer, <laughs> any writers who are in here to sketch it out first so that when you're in there, just draft and you're like, and then they turn, they turn left. Great. And you don't have to stop and get pulled out of your groove yeah. <laughs> as you're drafting and go, what are the logistics of this? What the heck is happening? So that's one of my, I guess it's world building related, but it's also just. Yeah, it is on a, on a micro setting level. Yeah which is still the world. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And I will say like, you do it very well in Dustborn. There are some, there are a lot of high octane scenes. So, and I could, and I knew, I have no trouble visualizing them. So clearly you have it very well awesome. grounded. I have, I should like, let me see if I have my, I might've put my Dustborn notebook away. Susan and I have similar processes in some ways. Susan is a you use index cards way more than I do, but you still do like a notebook. I wish per... you guys could see how many, there are literally hundreds lying in front of me right now. <laughs> I'm trying to find my dustborn notebook, which I think I put away because I was finally done with this project. But I have, um, yeah, I don't know where it is. I have those, some of those sketches. Show your desk, Suze. People are asking. Okay. Let me, let me, let me lay this out for you guys. I don't know if you'll be able to see. Yeah, there they are. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of index cards. Um, yeah, don't screenshot that, Kim. I see you. Don't you do that. It was so fast. It's going to be blurry. It wasn't. Uh, <laughs> and if you can read anything in it, you people you earn are it. responsible and not be leaking <laughs> spoilers it, to Susan's <laughs> books. <laughs> um, yeah, but I have some, I think I might have even shared them in a newsletter or something once. I have some. Uh, Powder Town was like very detailed in my sketches. I sketch out um, Bedrock pretty detailed also. Delta's settlement in, in Dead River. And yeah, I don't know. It just really helps me visualize my own world and understand how people move through it, how supplies and resources move through it, how the landscape and natural elements are going to affect travel and everything. So and you can always change a map, you know, you're not locked in. The Witchlands map has evolved. Definitely has there are things that like weren't on the original map. And then I'm like, now this place exists. Surprise, <laughs> it'll show up on a future map. You know, but that makes sense. I feel like as the story progresses, sometimes things get bigger. I feel like Lee's books did that, right? Lee Bardugo, Shadow and Bone starts with just the map of Ravka. What is it? Of Ravka, right? And then as you get into like the later books in the series, especially like Six of Crows and the spinoffs, then you've got like the whole, like the bigger view is zoom back. So yeah, you add as you need to go. Definitely. Definitely. Cause you, and it's more fun that way. You don't, it's all a living, breathing thing. Um, even when it's like in print, you can change something. We discover things as we go. And I guess like that would be another one of my pieces of advice to any writers out there who are building their worlds right now it's just that like don't feel like you have to have it all figured out like especially if you're writing a series like you're just gonna set yourself up to be disappointed with yourself if you feel like you need to know it all like some of it you're gonna discover along the way and that's totally normal I have always had surprises in my books um especially I really I, I don't have super long series like Sue's but like my debut trilogy like that's my longest series three books and by the third book I'm you know going oh, maybe that should happen. That's not what I pictured. I didn't think this was going to exist in this town or in this setting. And you just, you roll with it. It doesn't mean you, yeah, you didn't live up to your story or something. You discover things as you go. Well, should we head to the audience for questions? Yeah. Yeah. Let's answer your questions. Cause Susan, and I could talk about, I mean, and we can keep talking about world building if you guys have more world building questions, but we want to, we, we don't want to bore you guys either. So yeah. <clears throat> I am here with audience questions, but I'm going to start with one of mine as event coordinator perk. <laughs> and that is Aaron, you've been very vocal about loving maps. Um, I feel like every yeah. time you post on Instagram, you check for a map in a book. Um, and now you've written a book about a map. 
Uh, so what fuels this love of maps and how does this fuel your story? Um, I mean, I feel like we talked about this a little bit already. I personally just find that the map makes the story feel real. I love when I open um, a novel and there's a map. And this is also, I want to acknowledge some of the realities of publishing. Sometimes a book is totally worthy of a map. Um, and deserving of a map and doesn't get it because the book doesn't necessarily have the marketing dollars for it or the publisher hasn't planned on having one. So there are tons of amazing books out there that have really rich worlds that don't end up with those maps. So it's I not paid for all my own maps. Yeah. Like Susan, Just for you guys to know, my publisher was not going to give me a map and that's no reflection on them. It was the state of this book that this book truth, which that they didn't think anyone would buy. So I got a really tiny little budget and map was not in there so I spent my own money and hired somebody to do it yeah so and like that happens sometimes too so it's while it's wonderful to open a book and have a map in it it's not an indication of whether or not the book has like this really rich sprawling world or anything but when I open a book and do see a map it immediately makes me really excited and already feel like the world is real um I like them personally because I need them in my own world building process. Um, I think that they often are just really fun. A lot of map illustrators will put in details that that like um, have a nod back to something else in the story. Like Susan has this in hers. She had her illustrator put in like your sea foxes on your map and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah and the, the illustrator who did, her name's Virginia Allen. She does amazing, amazing map illustrations. She did dustborns and there's lots of little details. She actually had asked me to give her um, some information about like each location so that she could put in additional details. So like Powdertown, I don't know if this is going to come through. Powdertown, you can see that they have these pickaxes that cross over. Um, you can see that like, I'm going backwards now. So this is getting hard. Like Harley's Hope has this ship that also has sails, but there's no water. So what does that mean? Right? So like, that's like interesting as a reader when you pick it up and you start seeing those details. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, I love them. They're fun. All right, so some of the audience members have asked, what is your favorite part about world building? And then the twin question of what is your least favorite part about mm. world building? Suze, do you want to go first? I mean, least favorite again, I think is just when you discover you're stuck in your rules. Or <laughs> why did I, like for me, I know the witch lands, like one of the biggest headaches that's been for me is that I made the world so physically big. So I'm like, how do I have them cross a thousand miles? Right in two weeks when there's not cars or planes i don't know and so i that's like been my biggest thing is that like logistically i did not it looks cool i did not think about that from yeah. a story standpoint and it works on a synopsis when you're like just mapping things out you're like okay then they go there yeah and then you get to it and you're like how do they get there that's gonna no. take six weeks <laughs> yeah i don't what so that's one of the least favorite things certainly yeah. Yeah. You need like a teleportation, witch. just write in some new magic. I mean, no. <laughs> there are magic portals. I had to, I did have to create the magic portals that actually spoiler, not spoiler, but the, the magic portal doors in sight, which were something I had to create later because I was like, I don't know how to get them places. Here we go. <laughs> Half the time when we writers write ourselves into a corner, that's what happens. You either figure out the way out or you have to literally make a way out. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I kind of have that in immunity with contagion as well. Like these are cis like planetary systems that are light years apart, um, and they have FTL. But even with fa faster than light, does not mean instantaneous. Yeah. So eventually, what comes up in the second book is like the invention someone with a prototype for jumping. You know, instantaneous. Because I have the same thing. I'm like, shoot, I need to get these people. Um, yeah. So that's hard. Um, what is my my favorite, I think Suze and I kind of, well, I don't want to speak for Suze on favorite, but I've already said like some of my favorite is just the planning and the mapping out and like the, the inventing of what's going to be where, how are these people going to interact, how are goods going to be traded or um, travel across land. Least favorite, um, I don't know, writing yourself into a corner is definitely never fun. Um, 
I sometimes struggle too with just all of the nitty gritty details when you get down to like, especially in Dustborn, this was a struggle was just like resources when you're already in a world like Dustborn, which is so barren of making sure I had enough resources that people could feasibly survive in this awful world, but not, and then making it believable and realistic that these resources do exist on top of that, right? So sort of balancing the, uh, how far are people willing to suspend their disbelief and making sure your world lines up with that, that can sometimes be a challenge. And it was definitely a challenge in this book because of how harsh the environment is. Okay, so uh, Stephanie asks, character names in Dustborn are tied to the world building. Can you both chat about how you name characters and how important you think that aspect of world building is? That is a great question. And I think Suze is going to agree with me when I say I think they're really important in most worlds. I think they're really tied to world building. Um, not every name in Dustborn does this, but a lot of people in Dustborn are named after some they have some, their name has some relation to water of some sort. Delta is her name that ties back to Delta riverbeds. There's um, a baby that's born that she names Bay, like a bay of water. Um, there's someone named Reed, which, you know, a thing that grows in shallow water. Uh, someone's named Brooke. So like, this is the thing that the people of the world need most. It's a thing that they remember only through story. They haven't experienced on their own. So it has this really almost like magical mythical um, feeling to them. And so it's sort of a name that they go to and are drawn to when naming people. Um, so that fed into Dustborn. And I think for sure, I'll let you talk about it a little bit, Suze, because you have like different, a lot, a big span. Dustborn is a big world, but it's still kind of focused, whereas Witchlands is huge and sprawling with different countries and huge different cultures. Like, how do you think it ties in your naming to your world building? Yeah. I mean, for, for something like that, um, it's, I mean, with the Witchlands, I got really down to the nitty gritty, as we were saying, and like, you know, I was trying to sort of develop, I won't say I came up with languages, I didn't, the only one that I kind of came up with was the, for the Nomadsi people, but it's, I did sort of come up with a rhythmic feel for each culture, like, what does their language sound like, and how do I fit the names into that? Mm -hmm. So somebody just asked me recently on Tumblr, um, like, the Nomatsi names, they really liked them. How did I come up with them? And it was, it's not, not that clever, but I wanted it to feel a certain way. So every name has like a sort of soft sound and a hard sound. So it's like, it's Sult, Gretchen, Alma. There's, there's always like a, a rhythm to it. And I don't know that readers can sense it, but I know it's there. And then when I'm, when I'm creating new characters, I can always go to that sort of lexicon and figure it out. Like, this is the code I follow to make names. Um, and yeah, but then like, like with, with something that's, you know, more contemporary, like you for the, the girl in your middle grade, um, you know, that it's, it's, it matters, but in a different way, it's not, it doesn't have the same yeah. world building tie per se. I think that's true. I think if you're writing contemporary or anything with a contemporary element, like even like a, I don't know, like a paranormal romance or like a the luminary that starts in our world yeah. I think names matter but they they're usually more contemporary sometimes people I mean I think all authors do this you end up on a baby naming site being like what does this name also mean and you sometimes want that to have a, it doesn't have to fit perfectly you don't you don't want it to not feel like a fit I guess so I think that always sort of plays in a little bit but I think when you're building fantastical worlds or um you were saying, Suze, like, I don't know if people pick up on it, but I think, I think a really astute reader would, and I think maybe subconsciously, it's saw someone say like subconsciously we do. I think that's true. It's like how if you're reading a historical um, novel and someone's like, hey, dude, it's going to stand out because that's not the language that we're using or okay. Whenever I see okay in like, really has like with my Westerns, I know, they said, they said, I know. Oh, right. <laughs> right. So like some people pick up on it, some don't. And that's where you want the name to feel like it fits the world and the setting and the time and the culture that you're writing, I guess, is my answer there. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. All right. So Irene asks, Aaron, if you didn't go to school for writing specifically, how did you learn to structure a novel? Do you have any tools or tips that are particularly helpful? 
I did not go to school for writing. Neither did Suze. Most writers, a lot of writers that I know did not go for writing. Um, some did. Doesn't but hurt most to go to that school I know writing. didn't. Most published oh. authors I know have degrees in something else. Yeah, uh, agreed. Um, so a lot of what I learned, some of it is I think just your, I'm speaking generally for a lot of writers, when you get started, a lot of it is just like your subconscious instinct and your gut. And if you're a big reader, you have learned, you don't realize it, but all those years you spend reading, are you learning structure and um, classic beats of like, here's a setup, here's an inciting incident, conflict rises. Oh, now there's a big battle or a climax resolution. Like I learned that by being a reader um, and I would say, I don't actually think I had written, written, <laughs> I don't think I had read a single craft book about actually how to write a novel when I, until after I tried writing several, maybe it might, I might've even had a book deal before I read a novel about how to write craft. Um, I'm not sure I'd have to like think about dates and calendars, but I feel like once I started publishing, was serious about publishing, that's when I started actually reading craft novels. And I have learned a ton from them, um, but they are building on things that I feel like I innately knew from being a reader my whole life. So I think, I don't know if this is what you're asking, the, the crux of the question, but I'll say, if you feel like you need to go to school for writing to be a writer, you do not have to. And I'd say the biggest thing you can do to be a writer is to be a reader and read a lot and read widely and study what's happening in the books, what works for you and what you don't like. And like, those are the things you're going to learn so much just from that. I'm starting to ramble. Do you have anything on that, Susan? No, I agree. I mean, I, I, I came at it really differently, but I think that's because I'm a science, I was a scientist. So I yeah. came at this like science must follow steps. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, Teach me. yeah, you read a lot before you design. started, right? what you like took workshops and read yeah I mean I took like I lived in the middle of nowhere Germany at the time and I was doing freelance scientific data analysis and to pay the bills and um so I, I taught myself everything I needed to know online and I took workshops I read bunches of books wrote some novels that were terrible yeah um learned kind of what I was doing and then wrote my debut and sold that but I yeah, you can learn everything you need to know on the internet, believe it or not. If you want a, like an actual book recommendation, I think a really good one for like, you don't have to be super, super advanced is save. Oh, I have them right here. These yes. are my two favorite. Save the Cat Writes a Novel. This one's really great for like key beats. Mm -hmm. And then this one, as you get more advanced, this is super dense, but Susan turned me onto this one. And I love this. This is the anatomy of story. I, uh, I still devour craft books right now. I'm reading I do too. Gail Car you Well, then you might try. I'm really enjoying it. Gail Carragher's The Heroine's Journey. Yeah. She really breaks down that the heroine's journey is not something I've ever been able to wrap my mind around because there's just not that much out there applying it to writing in the way that there is the hero's journey. Because right, the hero's journey was originally a psychology concept. Um, and so is the heroine's journey. But no one's really, as far as I've seen, any resources written about applying the heroine's journey to craft, to writing books. And she does. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting. It's really good. It's actually made me realize that like every one of my books follows the heroine's journey, not the hero's journey. That's cool. I'll have to check that one out. Uh, the name was Gail Carriger. Gail Carriger, you know, who wrote the, like the soulless book, books. Um, she's famous for always dressing in steampunk clothes. Uh, she wrote The Heroine's Journey. I'm taking notes. Um, so let's see, we have a question here from, let's see, April. You've mentioned that you like throwing in your twists at the end of act two. Is the twist usually what you use to throw your story into the all is lost moment of the third act? I mean, not always, but it's a it's a perfect place to do it. That's usually, I mean, I think actually that that is sort of discussed in Save the Cat Writes a Novel, I think Jessica Brody even says that like a perfect thing to do to throw someone into All is Lost is to have a twist where character thinks X, truth of, you know, it's not X, it's Y is revealed. And then that's like a, ah, ah, right? Like that's like, it's a perfect moment. And I think um, it's not always a twist. Sometimes it's a death of someone really important, like, you know, Obi-Wan dying for Luke at, 
what is that's about like the two thirds mark in Star Wars, right? Um, it's even even the midpoint it might even be the midpoint you're right yeah it might be earlier but I mean the Um, midpoint in the but see usually the midpoint moment is the big reveal and then there's but my midpoint tends to come more at the two-thirds point but if you look at like a lot of craft books they say the midpoint but then I'm like I don't usually have it actually at the midpoint it tends to be more toward well because the middle and like save the cat does this too it shows you like percentages that each of your beats should take up and like the end of the novel is usually not like your third act is only like 15 or 20 percent of your novel and the middle is actually like most of your novel and then the setup at the beginning is like 15 percent um but yeah i think midpoint is a good point to have some of those reveals um which often triggers the all is lost, which is when they're having like introspection and thinking like, oh gosh, what am I gonna do? I feel like um, it's easy to kind of almost overthink all of those beats too. Sometimes that's I why just have reading, to trust my gut. That's why as Aaron was saying, like the more you read, the more you just sort of ingrain it or it, it becomes ingrained in you. But I will say when you're a beginner, it takes a long time and it actually it's okay because it feels really hard but that's a good sign yeah the more you're learning the harder it feels and that's good because it means you're learning how to do it but by the time you've written a bunch of books the more and more comfortable and more and more natural it will be but honestly Aaron and I will always hit points where we're like I don't know how to do this I don't know how to do it and then we'll talk to each other like help me yeah and Maybe we do help each other, or maybe just by talking, we figure things out, or maybe not. But it is it is totally normal to like, to just find that the more you learn, the harder it gets. Yeah, yeah, I keep saying like, it should be easier by now too, right? Like, shouldn't books be easy for us? But they don't, I think as you start getting, you stretch your wings and you get like, you become a better writer, you challenge yourself more, you write bigger, more complicated books. And so it's just, it's never easy. It's true. Um, so yeah. you always set your goal higher and your standard higher so you're always like well okay that yep. one was fine but i can do better and so then it's harder <laughs> i have to point out that if you go by the math the whilst uh, obi-wan's death does take place half about halfway through the star wars movie the second half of the movie has like a 15 20 minute space battle so like with actual plot points it's actually much right. much shorter but they are flying around in spaceships. I think beats are super helpful for when you're planning your book out. And when you look at most books, you can find all of these key beats, usually somewhere in the book, but they're not all going to hit at exactly the same places. It's sort of just like the roadmap. So yeah. Or even the same order. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes orders split. You throw off structure. Luminaries is like, was the weirdest structured book for me because it just didn't follow that normal you know, rise Wouldn't it be and fall? nice if there was actually like a, this is how you write a book and you just followed it and every single time it came out perfect. Yeah. Like Mad Libs. <laughs> just plug in the answers. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And there, book done. Boom. I wish. Angelica asks, where does the world building start for you guys? With a real world location, a character who needs certain things around them, something else entirely, or a combination of all of the above? Do you guys start with the world or the story first? depends i mean yeah i think it as aaron was saying like earlier you said it, it really you had you've had different experiences right yeah yeah it depends sometimes i've started with like my taken series started with a character who happened to be in this isolated town with a giant wall surrounding it where no one could you know climb over the wall without dying and then i was like well that's weird why and i built out the world from there um, but that one started with the character dustborn started with the world itself um but i think It doesn't really matter because people are a product, people are always products of their world. So you either come up with the world first and then discover what type of people would live in that world and, you know, how they function because of that world, or you start with the person and then figure out the world and figure out it's just in reverse. Oh, they think this, or they act like that because their world is like, so. That was a lot of vague words. I hope that made sense. <laughs> yeah, they're a product of their world. So you figure out why, how yeah. did the world produce this person? What right. about the world produced this person? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's that's absolutely the same for me. Other than the historical element of my first series where it was like, this is the world because this is the world. Um, but even then I had, I had the paranormal element of necromancy. So there was a whole magic system to build. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, it's the same. I, I'm the same. I think you either, I either start with care. I think I've pretty much always started with character and then gone into the world, but I am developing them side by side. So. All right, Erin, Brianna asks, what was one of your primary resources for doing research for Dustborn, books or articles? Uh, I don't know, because I didn't have to do research for this book in the same way I've had to do it for, um, historical fiction. It was more, it was probably more article based. Like if I was like, Ooh, someone's injured, like X, how long until that kills them? Or how are they going to recover? Or, you know, in what ways might they die? And then I go online and look up something really disturbing. Um, it was very focused research for this book because I was writing a completely fictional world. Um, Whereas with my historical fictions, it was more books. I like read a ton of books. Do you remember I sent you some stuff. Remember I sent you some of my books. I think I still have them. Did you send me like- No, you sent them back to me. You did. It was I just did? like- I did, okay. You did. Oh. It was just a while. It was like two years later, but it was fine because I didn't need them. So it was like, whatever. Oh, I just cool. panicked because I was like, because I have like a shelf. I'm like looking over here at my bookshelf. So <laughs> right here at the bottom is like my nonfiction. And so like- I have yeah. some books that are super helpful and I think I bought them like used. I have some that are like the writer's dictionary for 1880s yeah. or whatever, you know, and all the jargon that yeah. was in that time period. But I'm glad I returned the books to you. I was just- I think you did. I know you returned the ones I sent you on boats. I did I did lend you one on slang, but I don't need it. So if it was that one, you can have it. <laughs> I'll have to your send you a picture of what I have and return. This is like- Oh, a book lover's shame. Aaron's I'm not, I'm not, not. I didn't even oh. notice. Look, I, I didn't even notice. So. Until right now. <laughs> we'll find out, I guess. <laughs> we have like a whole bunch more questions. Do you guys have a little bit more time? Yeah. I do. Are you okay, Suze? Yeah. Husband's dealing with baby. Yeah. This is break. like, yeah, this is like a break for Susan and I. We're like kid free. We're like, let's chat. I feel like I got tomato red after realizing I might've stolen one of Susan's books. <laughs> um, we'll put a filter over the, uh, we'll go for like an old timey red Marsy like filter over. So it'll be like, dust born. Dust I mean, this born is what happens filter. to me in heat anyway. So it's very fitting. Um, I want to know, Erin, you just mentioned uh, disturbing web searches. What web search as a writer do you have each of you that the FBI would be concerned about and then go, oh, she's a writer, it's fine either of you probably like half of what i've researched i'm sure i have one i know from my first series which was how do you make nitroglycerin which is the component in dynamite so yeah. i was like that's getting me on some searches yeah i mean and dustborn a big part of it Suze, you're probably almost at this part um dustborn has like there's a whole community that makes black powder yeah. so that they can fire these weapons that they have. And so I did a ton of research in how you make black powder, like homemade in your backyard, like minimal ingredients, um, which, you know, is probably completely legal. It's just a little weird. So, it's and I've, I've also just researched a lot of, like, as I said earlier, like injuries and like, like, where can you stab someone to kill them instantly? Like searches like that, you know, <laughs> very weird things. That would be like the strangest Pinterest board ever. But yeah, I, I don't pin these things. They're bookmarked so that they're not public. For, they're just for me. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, what inspired you to write Dustborn? Someone specifically asked, did the climate emergency influence Dustborn at all? Um, it's definitely been something that's always on my mind. I don't want to say this book is strictly only about climate change or anything. Um, but I tend to always take elements with the exception of like, I would say with Contagion and Dustborn both, I wrote about something that kind of scares me. Um, ironically, I wrote about Contagion before we started living through a pandemic, so that's fun. Um, and then, uh, yeah, definitely, we're seeing it happen around us right now. Um, Dustborn gives you an, an absolute extreme, right, of like limited water resources, horrible weather and heat. What would that look like to live through? Um, and then some of it's just nostalgia. I've l always loved the Mad Max world. Um, I've always loved, this is half of why I liked writing Westerns too. I just like limited technology, really brutal, rough worlds. I don't know why, because I would not survive them and I wouldn't want to live in them or even visit them. Um, I don't know. I find them very fun to write. So. I don't know if any of your books have cell phones, really. 
I feel like Mm-mm. you like you like your characters to be cut off. You're not very kind to your characters, Erin. <laughs> No, I mean, Contagion has lots of tech, uh, but at least in, in immunity, they're able to communicate a little bit better, but Contagion's on like this really isolated planet and they have can only talk to each other. Um, yeah, how do you, is yours all, I'm trying to remember, Susan, because I've actually, I'm going to have to admit this to all of you guys, I haven't read all of the Witchlands. I've only okay. read Okay, I don't blame you. Look, my husband hasn't read but one <laughs> book in the Witchlands, so you're good, you're good. How do they, like... There are some, are there some witches that can? Yeah, I have these witches? called voice witches. And voice they, witches, yeah. They can communicate over long distances with each other, with other voice witches. Yeah, that was my workaround for right. I mean, instant communication. Because you need it sometimes for reasons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so with writing, uh, do you prefer, each of you, do you prefer to write a series or standalones? And with writing a series, is it something that you have clear before you write starting the story, uh, write, start writing the story, or is that, do you figure out along the way that you're actually writing a series? Well, Erin, having just wanted to write a series, would, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think there are pros and cons to both. Like, Standalones are really nice in the sense that like you write it and it's done and it's a self-contained story and, you know, getting really brutal with the realities of publishing. If the book doesn't perform, you're done. It's fine. You're done. You're not going to go on to either see your series canceled or spend all of those hours toiling over sequels for like only a couple hundred people to read it. it, That sounds like such a downer, but like that is one of the pros. Um, On the flip side, writing a series, you know, you already have the world. You already understand your characters. Some there, I don't want to say writing a sequel is easy because I've written some and they're not, but there's certain parts of it that are easier than writing the first book because you know the characters already and you know the stakes, you know where they're starting their journey from because you've already written that whole other book. Um, So I don't know if I prefer one over the other, but what was the second part of the question? There was another... Um, let's see. Uh, do you figure out that you're writing it right. along the way? Do you figure out along the way? I usually know upfront if it's going to need to be more than one book. Like Dustborn, I originally thought was a trilogy. And then all of my feedback when it went out trying to get sold was no one wanted to touch a trilogy, which is probably a combination of things. If we're being completely honest, yeah, it wasn't a reflection on the book. It was a reflection no, on the market. It was the market, it's dystopia, which is like a dead trend. Um, And trilogies in general, YA like had a big boom in a trilogy, that's a bigger investment, right? So a lot of the feedback was, I wish this was a duology. So I figured out how to make it work as a duology. And I think it that actually would have worked fine, but then I had to figure out how to make it work as a standalone. And so um, that was challenging, but I knew up front. The only time I didn't know up front, and this is probably just, you don't know what you don't know when you're new and fresh is when I was writing Taken, my debut, I was like, this is going to be a great book. And halfway through drafting that book, I was like, there is no way I can fit this all in one book. And that's when I stopped and went to a notebook and like very, very broad top level jotted out what I thought might happen in each book. And was like, okay, this will be three books. So that one I figured out while writing the first draft. Um, But everything else since then, I've known like Vengeance Road, this is a standalone. It's like its own book. Contagion. Oh, this is going to be two. Here's where I'm going to split them. Um, what about you, Suze? I mean, I wish I could write short. It's why I'm doing this story a month challenge where we write a short story a month. If you guys want to sign up, it's on my website. Um, because I just, it's a, it's a skill that I would like to have, but it, everything I try to write, it's like, I start writing it, I get into it. And then I'm like, oh, here's another six book series beginning. <laughs> what am I doing? Oops. Um, in, in fact, the only book I've written that wasn't a series was Something Strange and Deadly. But then at that time, trilogies were hot. So my agent was like, can you make it a trilogy? I was like, I didn't know yeah. That. So yeah, it was a standalone. And so then I threw in a new plot thread. I wove a new plot thread in there and a trilogy was born but I had no idea what was coming in the next two books wow Um, I'm actually the opposite of you I don't don't find sequels harder I find first books amazingly easy and then not easy but easier um I've never actually written a standalone so I don't know if that's easier but I know that first books I find very easy compared to the sequels the sequels is where I'm always like now we must deal with all the consequences of the first book all that planning you did 
I've never written a series as long as you, but I have noticed when you write sequels, like it's a relief when you get like sequels in big series, they get like this, right? And once they start, once threads start going towards the end, that's when it starts to feel refreshing again. So like writing my trilogy, I thought book two was the hardest out of that trilogy. Book three was me tying everything up. Book two was like, what the hell am I doing? And book one was just hard because I didn't really know the characters yet and stuff. So they each have their own unique challenges. Writing duologies, I don't suggest duologies either, Suze. The, I mean, I don't suggest years, writing. That's the take. It was going to be a duology. And then as I started working on it, I was like, nope, <laughs> this is going to be a trilogy at least, guys. So that's, that's what's well, happening. Duologies, so trilogies follow like beginning, middle, and end, right? That's how a, it's a natural book, structure. It's a natural yeah. structure of story. And duology is really hard because your first book ends in the middle. And then book two is your ending book and you're supposed to be wrapping everything up but the first half of it is everything like widening still because you're in the middle of the overall arch I don't know I find like immunity was the book that I wanted to like throw out a window uh that one was really hard and that's also why contagion is my only novel that I've written to date that ends truly on a cliffhanger it's kind of brutal and it's because you're in the middle it made sense I don't yeah. feel that bad about it sorry guys Lori says, one of my grad classes this semester is children's lit and have read dozens of books for children. Have either of you thought about writing a children's novel? Now, Erin, the pandemic ate your middle grade novel, but have you ever considered writing a children's novel? You were talking yesterday about picture books. Yeah, by children's novel, do you mean like early readers or do you mean like middle grade? So like I have one middle grade novel, Girl in the Witch's Garden, which is ages like eight to 12, I think. Um, there's also like early readers or chapter books they're sometimes called. Is that what you think? Is that children's novel? Uh, Lori, if you're still here, can you clarify? Um, the short answer is that I say nothing's off limits. I, I'll write whatever, if the story comes to me and I'm passionate about it, I'm gonna write it. Uh, I'd love to write picture books. Suze is giving the thumbs up. I'd love to write adult fiction. It's just, it's, the story comes to you and it fits in a certain box in publishing land, right? Like it, that's how they market everything. There's the middle grade. Someone mm -hmm. wanted to ask in the chat, show us a copy, which has oh, very yeah. Kayao Miyazaki. It Isn't does. It? It's so, it's so Miyazaki. I love it. It's a gorgeous yeah. cover. And it has that nice gold. It's really pretty. It's beautiful. But the pandemic did eat it. It came out in like June. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it ate it. Yeah. Um, but I'm not seeing a clarification of the question, which is okay. Cause I feel like I've kind of answered it anyways, that like, if I have the right story idea, I will be writing it. If, if it's the right idea and I'm passionate and excited about it, I'll write it no matter where it fits in like the marketing lingo or age category. She um, came back. She says more like early readers or picture books. Yeah. So I would love to write a picture book. Um, I talked about this a little bit on a live the other day that, um, I, I have written a picture book. It didn't go anywhere. Maybe it will. Um, but I intend to write more too, but I find them challenging. It's like the shorter the book, the harder it is just to, to find a story that has emotional resonance and beginning, middle and end, but is only like 300 to 400 words. Like picture books are short these days. They're not, they were lengthier when we were, when I was a kid and they're, they're trending very short now, which isn't a bad thing. It's just a challenge. Um, yeah. So I would love to write one. And I'm reading a ton of like early reader chapter books with my daughter right now. Um, actually starting to read them on her own which is crazy um have you had to start locking your phone because she's reading your text messages off your screen yet because that's something yes. i've had to start she's like the, <laughs> one at the start of this the one with the yeah. awful characters in college and at their reunion like she picked it up the other day and was starting to read it and i was like this book is full of inappropriate things for children and you can read so i need to take this away from you um but yeah so no, nothing's off limits and i would love to basically write any of those what about you, Suze? I know it was geared at me, the question, but would you write, would you like to write younger, older, any, anywhere really? Yeah. I mean, I'm the same as you. If I have an idea, I don't have much experience reading that stuff. So I feel like it's one of those, like you are able to write a picture book now that you've read a lot of picture books with your- You'll movie. be there a couple more years. And that's, that's my thought is like, yeah. I'm not, I don't have that experience, but you do see a lot of people write picture books after they become parents. Yeah. Now I get it. Mm -hmm. You have to have that base of knowledge. 
I yeah. deeply appreciate all the parents who do start writing picture books and they make it so that here's something if you do want to start writing picture books any of our audience members remember that if it's a good book you'll have to read it over yeah. and over and over and so like rereadability is very important because sometimes you might be reading it six times in a row yeah, um, yeah. So there are picture books that like I actually like because and I've had to read them millions of times and those are usually the ones that I end up buying and sending to Sue's being like for your baby yes I know <laughs> grumpy monkey is a hit right now I love that one that one's so clever so I think we have time for uh, just a few more questions here uh, maybe two more um, someone let's see here uh, how do you figure out, Erin, which quotes and pieces of pieces of the story to use in your graphic designs? Um, that is a good question. I feel like um, generic quotes usually work well. Basically, anything you're using in a design or a giveaway, like I have these quote cards that I did for pre-order incentives for Dustborn. It has to be like generic enough that anybody would want it, even if they, because they haven't read the book yet half the time, right? They're just requesting it. Um, ins if it, if it leans inspirational, I feel like that usually helps, um, like epic and empowering. Cause yeah, yeah. yeah I have like, to make my own graphics too. And I just, you just pick the ones that are the most like appealing, like, yeah, they, they can't be too specific. I think to any one character or the story itself, it's just like bigger, like Dustborns was, I will pull the stars from the sky. Like, yeah. Right. And like contagions was impossible is an excuse. Impossible is just an excuse not to try, I think. Right? Like they're, they're like these generic, like it's kind of cheesy. Like you see them on like inspirational posters of the sky with sunbeams, right? But that's kind of what you that's kind of what I go for. Um, if it's too specific, I feel like it doesn't hit. Uh, is there a trope you haven't yet written that you're dying to write? There's only one bed. <laughs> with enemies to lovers yes yeah that's like my that's one of my favorites I haven't written it yet yes 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 yeah. I need it now <laughs> yes I I maintain a spreadsheet with one of my coworkers at the store that has the tropes listed in romance novels so that we can we can recommend those so I'll call that out for you yeah um, Susan, wait hold on I want to know Susan's oh I don't know I have a whole list of things like I keep a list my my id list and it's like all of the really specific things that I love in stories so that if I'm ever stuck on a scene I can be like let's look at the id list what what is missing and I the one of the ones that I came up with the other day that I have no idea where I'll put this but I love it when someone's about to get this is so specific someone's about to get on a ferris wheel alone and then the love interest yes. shows up and is like i'm gonna get on with you and it's like oh oh he's rescued her uh-huh that i feel like, like that's gotta go into the scenario now somehow one day i will find a place for this <laughs> i love it well now i need to know would either of you rather write a fight scene or a love scene um i like love scenes i like fight scenes too as a martial artist but i I, the, my problem too though is and I'm sure Aaron you're too it's like you do such long slow burn or you don't have romance at all so you don't get to write them mm -hmm. but I, I feel yeah. like I write fight scenes and action scenes more than I write love stuff because like Susan romance is usually if it's in my books it's a subplot it's not I'm not like a romance writer that's nothing against romance as a genre it's just not usually what I'm writing and it's not what I have published yet so um and I know a lot of people, a lot of writers I know don't like fight and action scenes. They find them really challenging. And I think they're challenging too, but I also find them really fun. Because they uh, don't draw maps. They need a map. They need a they map. Have no trouble. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is, we will end with uh, what are your favorite books, Erin, in the genre? What uh, weird West sci-fi or what is something you've read recently that you highly recommend? Before we end, I would like to remind that Erin is signing copies of her books. If you would like a copy of any of Erin's books signed, we are very happy to sell one to you. We also have Susan's books available in our store. You are a bit far to come sign them for us, but I imagine you'll <laughs> sign them in your mind um so Aaron, susan's books are also available and aaron i will see you in person on saturday as well we are having a sidewalk signing outside gibson's bookstore um it's going to be our first in over a year so we're more than a little bit anxious because we're all out of practice and slightly feral at this point um <laughs> and we're we're trying to remember how to 
be people, but we're going to be with masks on and hand sanitizer and outside on Independent Bookstore Day on Saturday, April 24th um, at 1 p.m. And you're going to scribble on books for people, anybody who wants to drop by. So if anybody is um, in the area, please do pop in and we will end this event with the two of you. Any books you've read recently that you highly recommend or um, Aaron, Bill specifically wants to know if you have any weird Wild West or sci-fi books. Uh, that you I'm so really bad. Enjoy. I'm so bad about specific questions like this because I literally usually no. need to go to my Goodreads and like look at what I've read. Same. I just, I, it, it erases, it vanishes from your head. What did I just read? I, I know, I have no clue. Um, I feel like I'm gonna have to answer this like post recording. I'm looking at my bookshelf. Um, I know I went on a romance binge. I just read and reread a bunch of romance novels by my favorite romance author. So that's my answer. And yeah, who, I mean like who's your favorite romance author? Uh, Mary Baylog. She writes like really sweet, non-alpha male uh type and like not alpha male type uh romance and historical romance and i just really like them they always make my heart happy i'm like oh the world is good mm -hmm. <laughs> we need that right now right yeah. um i i think um for the specific like weird west like this isn't super weird west but like sort of western dystopia blood red road by moira young is really so good. good um so and I feel like there's others and I just can't think I'm, I'm looking at my bookshelf. I just can't think right now. So that would be my one in that specific genre that I really like. And then um, in terms of what I read recently and really liked, I mentioned this to you the other day, Elizabeth, but I'll say it again for everyone here is The Electric Kingdom by David Arnold. Super weird, but like really good. And I really liked it. And I just like, I didn't know where it was heading and I liked that. I don't know if that makes sense. Like it was one of those books that I was like, I don't know how this is going to go, but I'm invested and I'm going to keep, I'm just going to trust that the author is going to deliver. And he did. Um, and the fun, the fun bonus is it's set in New Hampshire, which is really cool too. So that is cool. Well, thank you to the both of you. Thank you for our audience for sticking with us while we answered all those extra questions. Suze, thank you for joining us. I was, Erin's yes, been you. talking for years about how she really wanted to have you up for an event and we managed to do it now. It was so, virtual. One of these days we'll do it like in person, but you know. Thank you so much to the two of you. Erin Bowman's new book, Dustborn, is out today. Thank you so much, everybody who pre-ordered. We do have signed copies available at the bookstore, and Erin is coming back to sign more when we get more in as well. She'll, we'll be having you in a couple times, I'm sure. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you, everybody who came. Thanks for being here.